Uh, we've got Francisco Menendez. He's the founding artistic director at UNLV. Jared Brown, creative director of Innovative Education Studios at USF. And then James Coddling, he's the virtual production technical director at Final Pixel. So I want to start by having each of you tell us a little bit about your background. So Jared, why don't we start with you? Yeah, um, like you said, I'm the creative director at USF. Uh, I've been working there for about 10 years now, and we create uh, content for online education, uh, documentary series, marketing promotions, but our vast majority and, and our main focus is creating engaging content for online education. Uh, and our team is just trying to get on the forefront with this kind of technology, so. Uh, well, we started uh, during the pandemic creating virtual production through Zoom because we had to keep them directing. And so people looked camera right, camera left. We used the spotlight function in Zoom and the ability to be able to put backdrops at the same time researching the advent of virtual production. And then once we got off the pandemic, we immediately leaned into getting our wall. And it really is about convincing the students that this is not a backdrop. This is about creating space and how to how to give the illusion of that creation of that space and also how friendly the wall can be if it's a flat wall that it won't take up the footprint of other competing people in that space. James, tell us a little bit about your production background. Yeah, so um, my name is James. I work for Final Pixel as their VPTD. Um, so Final Pixel is a global, um, global virtual production company um, specializing in end-to-end -end virtual production using LED screens and Unreal Engine. Um, my personal background, I started in the classic like production, um, going through like runner and everything like that, but then I moved into green screen. Um, and then throughout the pandemic, I self-taught Unreal Engine um, and then started with Final Pixel um, during the pandemic. And then we also run a training academy uh, and provide virtual production specific training to higher education um, and also industry professionals as well for upskilling. So we heard a little bit from Francisco talking about how he and UNLV got introduced to virtual production. I want to hear about um, the USF and Final Pixel stories as well. Let's start with you, Jared. Talk a little bit about um, how virtual production kind of came onto the scene, um, how it got you know on your map, so to speak, and um, how you got introduced to it. Yeah, I mean, I think my first is first experience with it is probably every a lot of people's is seeing it like The Mandalorian and watching behind the scenes. But my true first introduction is is View. They're a mile down the road from our from our studios um, and we saw what you guys were doing in such a quick amount of time and obviously my eyes got really big um, we kind of dove into virtual production uh, a different route with like the green screen route but also using tracking in that route and at the at the time thought that the LED wall was out of our um, you know possibility uh, and then working with you guys we made it possible and and I'm not gonna look back That's awesome. James, how about you? Yeah, so um, again, very similar, like the Mandalorian was a big thing for everyone. Um, and then throughout the pandemic, obviously the, the shift in industry, having to go to remote working and find alternative ways to keep production going was a big thing. So the company Final Pixel actually started during the pandemic. Um, so we had uh, two partners in the US and one partner from the UK form a new company and explore this new technology of VP. Um, but we've always had like a very specific uh, angle with training as well. So Francisco, I'm going to go to you with the next question. I know uh, UNLV recently had their LED stage uh, installed, so you've had it for five weeks. Maybe. Five weeks. All right. So talk a little bit about how you've used virtual production to date. We started right away. Uh, even uh, the end of training day, we immediately put something that we were working on for about a year on green screens uh, and immediately could tell the difference. The impact was amazing on the students, and it was Taking, we have a future cinema class, so uh, we veered away from uh, virtual reality in 360 and went straight to the wall and immediately started to have students uh, move through the space and, and make decisions about the background because it's, it is Final Pixel, not only your company, but that is the whole thing that they can actually, this is it. There's gonna be nothing more we're gonna do except some color grading, some sound design, and obviously some editing. So it's been very exciting how quickly uh, the result has happened, thanks to the technology, and how amazing View has been through this whole process. 
So Jared, I know the application for you guys at USF is a little bit different. You know, you're operating more of a creative studio, capabilities that you deliver back to the university. So talk about how you're currently using virtual production. Yeah, um, much like them, ours is just recently completed. Uh, we had an initial install in January, uh, finished up, I just finished up the ceiling and all the tracking a couple weeks ago. So we have been using it in a lot of different ways already though, without the tracking as, as a background as much as we could and, and using creative ways for it. So you can do it the traditional way. Um, but essentially we're, we're trying to make that engaging backgrounds and one of the biggest things we're doing is recreating some scenes around our university that are typically the most beautiful scenes but the most difficult places to film. The place that everybody wants to film but it's very loud. It, it's 110 degrees and humid in Florida in the summer. So we're recreating that in Unreal Engine, uh, photorealistic and we're going to be using that so a lot of the stuff we can knock out really quickly. The biggest thing for us is we produce, um, we work with a learning design team to produce 80 to 100 online courses every semester and then that includes could be over 100 video productions so we have to be very efficient and uh, the load has gotten bigger and bigger since the pandemic because there's that many more online productions so um, this has been a godsend because we can just knock things out really quick we can put two or three four shoots that would normally take a whole crew pick up and, and scene change on campus or go to different locations we can bring it here now uh, we don't have to travel as much, which we love traveling. And it's not going to be, it's not going to go away because we don't want it to. But um, it's just been very helpful to do that. And on that point, we don't teach, but we have interns and we help uh, we help guest speak at, at different classes. So we get to do that, and students are getting into that. We're we're planning on being able to start pushing people into the job market and teaching that. So that is like down down the line, our team will be hopefully teaching some classes and getting students yeah. into the job market. It's a good segue to my next question, James, for you. So um, at Final Pixel, obviously you guys are, are not a, a university or a production company, but talk about how you're investing in the next generation and tell us a little bit about Final Pixel Academy. Yeah, so the Academy started about uh, just over a year ago and it was very much at the forefront of what we wanted to do was keep developing new talent into the industry and upskilling existing industry professionals to make sure that they were developing with the change of technology, especially with virtual production. Um, so we started developing online training courses, obviously coming out of the pandemic, a lot of stuff was online. Um, but now we've got sort of a range of um, job specific training courses, whether it's for directing, producing, technical artists, stage technicians, um, but then also doing bespoke courses. So we have worked with a couple of universities in higher education. So we have a partnership with NYU um, to deliver virtual production training. And we've also just finished uh, a course in the UK with Buxner Uni um, delivering for their uh, bachelor students. That's great. Um, next question is for Francisco and Jared both, just in the um, kind of the, the setting of a university. So. Talk about how virtual production on campus is bringing together previously disconnected departments like film, broadcast, media, gaming. Um, it, it does seem to be kind of a galvanizing tool. Um, so talk about how it's um, you know bringing some of those departments together. I think uh, theater and film. You know, there's sometimes uh, uh, an impossibility of being able to schedule actors because of their rehearsal times at night. And by having virtual production available to us during the day, they're able to collaborate with actors in a deep way and be able to learn how to speak to them and design the spaces that are in there. Obviously, there are other uh, new stakeholders that would like us to collaborate with the wall, and we're way open to it. And uh, it's definitely brought a, a lot of different departments together. We're, we are a, a different use case where because we're not teachers, uh, some people don't know that we exist on campus unless they come and develop courses with us. So we've pretty much been giving tours of our space every single day since we've, since we've moved in last year. And they see the wall and it's a big wow factor, right? So um, we're, we're now already working with four or five different departments to start thinking about developing coursework and majors toward this, which is something we've never done before, even though we wanted to. Just the, the interest wasn't as much there because they couldn't see why. Um, so now that they that we've explained the job factor to this, it's you know universities are very job focused. They want you to be job ready when you leave. So um, it's definitely brought us together with College of the Arts, our communications department, 
theater we've been working with. Uh, last week we did a production with them, uh, and and it's been really great to see that people are finally getting excited for this. We're all on the same team, right? It's the university, so um, it, sometimes it's competitive, but now it's kind of bring taking a little bit of that edge away. So I want I want to hear um, from kind of the students' perspective in this. How has virtual production and having access to this technology unlocked new creative possibilities? Um, how has it you know, maybe reinvigorated some of the passion and excitement that they have for film and production. Talk a little bit about what you see virtual production doing for, you know, for, for students. Again, it's a synthesizing point in terms of being able to uh, not use a green screen. They can actually see if there's an uncanny nature to the, the environment that they've developed and they can, they can immediately get feedback. We can do uh, two hours of shooting, two hours of sort of looking at last week's cut in a four-hour course, which would normally spread over 12 hours otherwise. So the ability to be able to immediately, kind of what James Cameron found in Avatar, he could just get the actors into the suits and work them 12 hours a day, as opposed to kind of the slow rhythm of production, which everybody sort of you know, start slow and then by the end of the day you're kind of running. In virtual production it's really well timed out and very effective in an educational way. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's just, again, that, that wow factor. Uh, I know uh, one of my coworkers, Ryan Watson, who works in Z School, he, he mentioned and he brings his class in that students that aren't normally as engaged sometimes see this as like this bright new shiny thing and they get super excited about it. and. It just brings a different level of, of, out of them, so they really want to be part of it in any way possible. So I think it's just like that excitability of something so new that they didn't know existed. Now, oh, I can have a job in, in six different aspects. It gets people excited. James, what have you all experienced? Yeah, and I was going to say, uh, expanding on that, like the eye-opening opportunities that it can provide to students, like the, the variety of roles, like a student who might have been studying post-production, for example, would have thought, okay, post, that's it. That's what I'm gonna do, editor. But now they have this broad scope of roles available to them um, where they can be on set, for example. So I think it's changed the way that students are looking at entering the industry and what roles that they can go into. I, I, you know, it's amazing to actually see those connections happen immediately, as I mentioned, and the ability to be able to put what normally would be in post, as you mentioned, into pre-production, because in virtual production, pre-production is everything. The other thing that people are a little frustrated about is, are they gonna get through the Unreal course? Are they gonna get, and we, at the very beginning, are sort of doing what the, the immersive art space in Zurich is doing, which is subtractive design. So taking exa existing sets, changing colors, removing certain elements, just like you do a digital I'm sorry, a, a scout in the real world, you kind of do it, uh, a digital scout, as they sort of do that, and they can do that a lot quicker than actually building everything from the ground up. What are, um, what are the challenges, what are the biggest challenges or, or hurdles that you feel higher education faces as it, as it enters into virtual production? Is there anything that you guys are observing that, you know, is a hurdle that you just have to overcome? I think the biggest plus is safety. You know, we have... Uh, an urban set that if we actually took people downtown and set craft services and it just it would be a nightmare and here they can actually get that those locations shot and done in a couple of hours as long as they've done the preparation before obviously we worry about uh, pixel pitch shifting on us and we see 0.5 and 0.7 on the floor and we're like oh we're going to change these panels out already, but we realize it's probably going to be every three years till we kind of sort of think about that. And it's really not about changing panels, but finding a larger space to sort of do the second one. I was going to say there's, for me, I've ex from what I've experienced, there's two big limitations or barriers, I would say, is, again, the hardware itself. Yeah. Um, and having it needs, need to trickle down into sort of the, the indie scale and the education sector as well. So that's, uh, as it develops, it gets cheaper and that's when it's gonna become more available. But then also it's the access to people working in the industry and having that 
knowledge being pulled from them into the higher education space because as we all know like higher education can sometimes fall behind industry and it is always a game of catch up so i think being able to bring in industry professionals who are working in this new technology is the most beneficial way to overcome that yeah, i mean just kind of the same thing that they're saying it's just the education part not it's so new uh, not knowing what to do or how to operate it right now even for us it is just learning so there's a learning curve but i think in education that should be can't look at it as a barrier but an opportunity to say hey we have a whole new major we can start with jobs so i think that's probably the biggest barrier getting the hardware is, is tough but you know it's there are lots of reasons why you would get it the efficiency and and the amount of things you can create you know it's an easy sell and, and just to add one thing you know we were we did this thing at ba with with you and uh it was incredible how they already had certain things in their toolkit in terms of the operating of the gamepad to move the camera. Um, they, were, they were very precise in ways that they did not expect to be precise. And a lot of, a lot of skills that have sort of been ga gained through their experience that existed outside film in their enjoyment of games are some, somehow synthesizing very quickly. So I've got one more question, then we'll open up to questions from the audience. Uh, so be prepared for some questions you guys have for, for the panelists. But um, what do you guys see the future of film and media education looking like? And, and what excites you about that? How does virtual production play a role in that? I mean, it'd be hard to say that this isn't uh, going to be a big part of the future. I mean, look around this conference. There's not a booth that doesn't have an LED wall. So um, I think this, I think film is still going to have a lot of the same stuff it's always had, but this is an advancement that I think you have to get on the train or you're going you're gonna to get left behind because there's so much cool stuff that goes into this and you look around this conference and it's, it's exciting to see already what you can do. I mean, this kind of started maybe five years ago, right? Um, and I think... The future is very bright for students that get involved now. They'll have jobs. There are a lot of jobs needed, and nobody to do them right now. So I think this is the future, and I think it's it's only going to get crazier as we go on. Every six months, there's something new. Like he just said, I'm looking at 0.4 pixel pitch a year ago it was 3.9. So um, every six months, I don't know, maybe, maybe not every three years, every six months, I feel like tech is just like, hi, I just bought that. So, oh, well, we will like, only be able to afford it every three years. Well, and I, I think that's where it's going to go, though. I mean, is is I think the barrier to entry is going to go down like every other technology. So I think that's the biggest thing. And people are going to need to buy it or they're going to lose students to other universities. So. How about you, Francis? So, uh, you know, most of the students in a film program feel that what when they learn is when they go out and shoot. And what's great is they can go out and shoot right in a space like this and all of a sudden get very nuanced feedback and that will just kind of get that production cycle going whether they're outside or they're inside. And I think we'll have LED walls in every department uh, pretty quickly. But most of them will use them like standing sets, you know, I mean like the back of a news program or what have you, and maybe with some video behind it. But the what we want to do is we want to sort of make people unaware that it was done virtually, that it was just looks like a story. I think what we're excited to see at Final Pixel is the the new courses that come out of this development is the the majors and the modules and the dedicated courses that are all tailored to virtual production and the knock-on effect is that the students that are coming into the industry are so much more skilled than people who are already in the industry in similar roles because they'll be experienced right off the bat in using these technologies and then what you were saying there's so many jobs available it's like if you have that one little bonus of having experience then you're more likely to get it so yeah definitely the the change in the in the courses and the students coming out so let's open it up to Q&A. If you've got any questions for our panel, feel free to raise your hand. We've got a microphone that we can come around and, and get to you. Don't be shy. Hey, uh, what battles with uh, Moray effect and that sort of thing have you had? You're talking about pixel pitch, you know, keeps coming down. 
That's awesome. But for the affordability at the beginning, you don't you don't get the the point four. So uh, did that hinder any of the development uh, in your teaching? You know, we always even when we normally sh we teach the students to sort of be five feet away from a wall anyway, seven feet of pro so, so that the art department can actually dress and we can actually have backlights and actually see the spaces. So from a program point of, point of view, it's just about then being able to afford 27 feet this way and 13 feet that way as kind of the minimum for us. But we were working on a very small wall uh, for, and I was amazed what because uh, of of what you can do in virtual production and give that parallax uh, effect and and make it look we were we were very close to the I would never ever tell students to be ever that close to the wall and it was it looked great yeah we haven't really had many issues I mean there's some like tilt and pants stuff at first but it kind of worked through the issues so there's a lot of things that we didn't know right away like we didn't know it's great to have genlock and that kind of stuff that we just didn't know because we were new to it we found that out and kind of fixed the problems. And it's just a learning process, but a quick one, because like, like Vue is very hands-on. So you give them a call, they'll call you back, or they'll answer right away, and oh yeah, just fix this, this, and this. Or for us, they're right down the road, they come down and fix it. So um, at, we're very fortunate in that, obviously, but um, it's all stuff that is easily fixed, for the most part. Um, I, I, I haven't had a situation yet where it's been an issue, but I'm sure you could find one, but there's a way, to, a way around it. Yeah, I think it's more about knowing the capabilities of your space and your hardware. So once you identify your limits and what you can and can't do, um, then passing that knowledge on and continuing to develop that, you identify what, you, what your capabilities are. So how close you can film up to the screen with your, with your focus and what angles you can go for before the, the color starts to, to shift. All of those types of things is stuff that you learn through doing or through asking. So I'd, I'd say learn your space, learn your kit, and just get hands on. Film program. I work with a film program at a university in Tennessee. And the um, question I have is how do you convince administration and other people that might be writing checks above you that this is the direction to go? Safety. I mean, not only safety in terms of another pandemic, but just safety in terms of. You know, uh, anything that, you know, cars, people crossing streets, all that. And whenever you have an urban setting, you have all the, and parking. Parking is, is a huge problem in terms of production. You don't get that. I mean, they're coming to the same studio uh, that they work. So I think, but safety is one of those things that we're very concerned, you know, with the incidents that happened in California, the stuff that happened in Rust. So I think it's, it, I think that's, that's the way to lead in. And also the wow effect that you've been talking about, the moment that they see, oh really, that was done there? Or they come in and you, you, hold, uh, you hold back when you press the button that all of a sudden it comes up. You don't, you don't kind of bring them in. So a little bit of seduction, a little bit of production. Yeah, I think the biggest sales pitch is, is showing uh, the jobs. I mean, what, what jobs you can get out of it, it's completely new. It's definitely, a, it's definitely not a super easy sale at first because they, you know, most people, administrators at schools want to see what's the number. Uh, you know, what am I paying? They don't care about all the other stuff. But, you know, it, it was actually much easier to sell because there's, it's visual. It's very visual. Um, the wow factor, just seeing it and saying that we have it, brings students in to say, oh, wow, they have that. I didn't know they had that. We can come in. Once we have classes come in, the students are just rude and odd, and then they tell the next person the next person. So... Um, but when you sell it too, I know we've talked to the Dean of the College of the Arts right now and he just was blown away by, by what we can do so quickly and he's already wants to start a major because he sees job opportunity. So he's researched it himself. We've kind of showed him a lot of things that we've already researched in the short time we've had it and it's just jobs, jobs, jobs. The university's job is to get you ready for a job and make money after school. So it's, it's easy enough to, to tell him that. But you have to obviously show them some of the stuff. But, it sells itself. It's, it looks awesome. And also, with our experience with like higher education partners, it's about identifying the benefits 
and how it can benefit more than, say, one course. Like you were talking about collaboration between multiple courses, because then you're not just saying, oh, we need this for the film course. You can in involve the motion graphics course and the 3D and an animation. And if you can identify the benefits for more than, more than one and how it can benefit a larger group, you're more likely to, to get that funding. Uh, yeah, I just got a question around how do you overcome the hurdle of creating curricula when we're in a, such a fast-changing space? Are we talking VP? What is VP? What is ICVFX? What is the terminology? Uh, you know, so how do we how do we settle on the curricula that we're trying to that is industry want? Um, you know, how do we get to that point? I would say working with an industry partner like Vue or Final Pixel, it's like you're getting the current industry knowledge from those people who are working in it. So terminology is a big thing. A lot of companies have different titles for job roles, even though they are the same across different different companies. So there isn't, because it's such a developing industry, there is no definitive way to do it, I guess. Everyone's kind of writing their own playbook, writing their own workflows and pipelines. So it's about finding what works for you and your organization and pulling as many resources and information from the people around you and the network as you can. And, uh, you know, Noah Kadner, who was with Tim uh, speaking uh, earlier this week, wrote the Virtual Production Handbook, which is PDF. Now it's in uh, volume two as well. And they sort of outline what all those positions are. In film school, we synthesize some of those positions because we can't have that big a crew. So we just have to figure out what the best uh, way to do it for every program. You know, you won't be able to, everything that goes into a virtual production uh, is very similar and very different from film. And you just have to identify and be able to separate or invent, uh, as you mentioned. Can I just add to that really quickly? Um, a lot of virtual production is very scalable as well. So like the virtual production um, guide, guidebook is very, gr very good, but if you're working at like an indie company, you're not gonna have all of those jobs, all of those crew on set. So it's about learning what the scalability is and how it affects bigger and smaller companies. Like we're not all ILM, we haven't all got like Disney budgets. What can you do on your scale within your budget and how does that change the workflows and the team and the roles and all those things? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, kind of just mimicking them. We, we're still learning too. So um, like we said, we're trying to work with places to create courses around this, but that's our plan. We don't know what that looks like yet. We're trying to figure it out, but we're basically using Vue as, as a partner to really teach us that. And you know, meeting people like this at these conferences, we're still learning that. So it's all in its infancy and our end at least, figuring that out. And I don't know all the terminology yet. I just have people on my team that are championing it. And you have to have those people. You have to hope that somebody on your team is really going to love to do it and really get into it. So that's kind of what we're pushing for. Hi, uh, Danny. I'm a director of production at Lux Machina. Um, I have a very diverse team that I work with within my team, but if I look around the industry, that diversity quickly goes away. So I'm wondering, from an educational standpoint, one of my commitments is how am I reaching out to the industry, especially to people who look closer to me, and how do I bring them up through these programs? So I'm wondering what you guys are seeing from that diversity standpoint, and what more we can do to help to bring those people forward, because I think it's really important. UNLV is one of the most diverse campuses in the nation, and I think the most important thing is to train uh, all that all that population. Oops, there goes that phone. I didn't need it. Uh, and and I think if if someone is trained, they will go and intern at VU. So thank God for those things. There's no longer that separation between the people who were good at camera and other people, the amount of selfies, the amount of video, the amount of TikToks that they do, they, they're not scared to deal with media. Now it just requires best practices and training and then just when people need, I just got a bunch of texts about we need this person, we need this person. If those people are trained, people will, will lean forward and, 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 and take them. Um, I think the post-COVID, industry um remote working has become a massive thing for especially in the world of virtual production so utilizing teams that are international as well you're able to get a lot more diversity within your company within your education as well um, but then also there are some really great organizations who champion diversity in media um, and the technology industries so getting partnerships with those companies um, and 
learning how to better incorporate diversity into your um, curriculum and into industry in general is definitely the way to go. The great thing about VIEW is, you know, you talk about them being a mile, they're a mile from us too. Because they're national and now international, I think anybody who has VIEW in their city feel that they're local. So there's this weird thing about them being here, but they're here and they're here and they're here and it's a network. And so far they've been very helpful uh, in collaborating. And as long as you're willing to sort of work with them, they will work with you. And that's, that's great so far. Any other questions? Did that answer your diversity question? Did that answer your diversity question? I don't. I, the diversity you're seeing in your classes, though, like we can all talk about the organization. We're, the we're over fifty percent women, and and we're a Hispanic-serving institution. Great. So I mean, the, yeah. It's, and UNLV is a. I work. I lived in Vegas for five years, and it's a unique campus. And I think you've got a, a unique space in the industry because of the city you're in. Yeah. But I don't know what, what you know. I I see what comes into our interview requests, and it's. It's primarily male and, and white, and it's hard because, like, I want to hire the best person, but I also want to have some diversity in that space. Of course. So I'm no, looking I understand. for that. Yes. And as, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty important to me. And I'm trying to figure out, but also what can we do as an industry to help improve that? Like, I'm not just expecting the education level to fix it. I want to say, you know, what can I do? What can I, how can I reach? From an educational standpoint, is the train train everyone within that portfolio of diverse students we have and not make it so that only the top cinematography students who may be as you described but bring it into the beginning so that they can take those skills and develop them I think obviously diversity is a very important thing for our university too and I don't have I don't teach classes right but I do know like working closely with you partnering with somebody like that they go out into the they're very heavily into the community in Tampa I'm sure every other place they are, and they bring it to small schools and they, they push it out everywhere so that every student, every kid, K-12, through college sees it. So I think the biggest thing is just partnering with the people who are doing it and, and getting out there and talking, like volunteering for things like this, I think is the biggest thing I've seen because it's so new, but they want everybody to know because ultimately they need people to work for them. And again, nobody, nobody cares what they look like, they just want them to be able to do the job. So that's the most important thing, I want to be the best, but it doesn't matter what you look like. I think that's it's a really good point. You know, we're accessibility to the industry is important to us. And so there can be a very, um, I guess, overwhelming feeling when you, when you look at the technology and you kind of look at everything that's at stake. Uh, it can feel almost insurmountable. So figuring out ways to make it more accessible for all is a huge part of, of our, our effort. And so um, I think that, that starts to kind of speak to what you're, what you're asking about as well. Any other questions? These have been awesome. I love audience participation here. So obviously the uh, LED panels are fairly cost prohibitive in some situations, but what do you think about the viability of multiple smaller kind of like short throw projector situations with some of the more affordable tracking solutions? Do you think students can still get the same sort of practical experience with some of those in terms of a lot of the scalability that you talk about, um, but maybe more students can be exposed to that technology because it doesn't have quite the price tag up front? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I came out of the pandemic convinced that virtual production had, had a place in the academic setting and teaching students about collaboration and directing. And at first it was just pull up green screens and finding uh, desirable five uh, unreal back then it was four four two seven you know that would kind of allow us to output stuff that we could put in those green screens and as I was kind of moving across internationally and nationally talking about how you can sort of use these very cheap tools and we uh, inexpensive tools uh, we just played with the HTC uh, uh, Vive Mars uh, tracking system. It was incredibly impressive, you know, and I have one sitting under my desk, but I'm preparing for this, and I, now I feel like I'm really comfortable trying to do that. So there are tools out there 
that can kind of, you don't have to put up a wall right away. It, you want to sort of see if there's an interest in telling stories in this way and what, maybe not you, but the rest of your faculty, what their interest is heading toward the wall. Because if you just get a wall drop on you, I mean, I've seen many big film schools that end up using the wall and they end up using, do, using it for music videos with fireworks behind them, as I said. And basically, I'm like, you couldn't have done that with a green screen? I mean, to me, there are many more interesting uses of the wall to create depth and shape to scenes and intimacy and all these things and safety. So I just think that's all there. And you can start with just, there's plenty of green screens cheap on Amazon now for you to sort of start that. And you can even use, as I talked about, I started using the Xbox S Matrix Awakens city sample that comes free to kind of start creating and designing those things. Does it have parallax effect? No, but it actually captures the student's imagination if you're sort of dealing with their environment and, and what, they're, what they're interested in doing. And eventually that led to a wall. And that's, you know, I, if a year ago you told me you're gonna have a 27 by 13 wall. I would say that's impossible, unthinkable. And there it is. And now we hope to do more and more and more. I think it's more about identifying, am I on? I think it's more about identifying the workflows. And this, the technology doesn't really matter at the end of the day because you can go big, you can go small, you can go really expensive if you want to. It's about learning the skills behind each of these components. Like you were saying, with like learning how camera tracking works with an HTC Vive, that's very transferable into like the bigger tracking systems like OptiTrack and Moses and all of these other ones. Um, but it's a, about identifying the key workflows and the skills behind it, and then you can progress as you move into the industry and as you develop. Um, so, yeah. I mean, you can do this, you can get the same effect on a 85 inch TV behind you or a 50 inch TV, I've seen people do it. Um, so it is, it's very scalable, but you're right. We started a couple years ago just testing something out with our vibe that we had and trying to do it on a green screen very similarly. And learning that helped us start on this a little bit easier, but it's a learning curve, but just getting the skills to do it, you can do it in a million different ways. And like you said, there's a million different trackers, and millions, but they're all pretty closely related, so.